The polls do not look good for you. Um, they've got you anywhere from 6 to 12 points down, and uh, the New York Times poll blogger predicts that you have a 92% chance of losing. How do you stay positive in the last few weeks of the campaign? Well, let me just say, you know, it's really true that the only poll that counts is on Election Day. And polls are a, a, a window of what might happen today. Our own internal polling shows it's about a three-point race. And it's all about people going out to vote. So I am the standard bearer who has to say what's important. That's what it's about, telling people what's important and why they should vote and why they should vote for me. Those are the kinds of things that, that I think uh, keep me going every day. I believe very much in what I'm doing. So it's not about polls. It's about believing that you're on the right side of New Mexico families. It's about believing that you can make a difference as governor of the state of New Mexico. And it's about continuing to be out in our communities, listening, talking, communicating with voters in New Mexico. How important is turnout going to be to you on election day? It's very important. You know, we, we learned in 2008 that turnout makes all the difference in the world. Uh, and we have people working everywhere, eight locations around the state. We have a lot of uh, opportunities for people to volunteer. The more they hear, the more they're, uh, the more they're volunteers that are coming in our doors. So I think it's, it's important. And, you know, for all the things we do, electronically and all those ads, all the clutter that's on television, really what gets a person to go to vote is human to human contact. Is somebody saying, here's why I'm gonna vote for Diane Dennish and Brian Cologne. Let us tell you more about them. Let us help you get to the polls. At the end of the day, we know that it's person to person, human, interaction that gets people to go out. You know, you've been involved in politics for a while now. How has early voting changed the way campaigns are run? Well, it certainly has extended the length of a campaign. It's made them more costly in many ways uh, because we spend a lot more money on television and, and uh, radio and commercials. So I think it's made them more costly. But it's also an important element of just accessibility, of convenience. Uh, getting people to go to the polls. But we know that 50% of the voters are, are, are going to vote by Election Day, and the other 50% are still waiting to make up their minds. They're waiting till the very last minute to make up their mind who they're going to vote for on Election Day. Let's go back to the money in this campaign. Were you expecting to see this much money come from out of state? Well, I, I wasn't, actually, and uh, my opponent has taken $800,000 just from the state of Texas, just from the state of Texas. Uh, I think it's been a surprise to every New Mexican that anybody in any election in New Mexico would accept a campaign contribution from a Texan of $450,000. Susanna Martinez took the single largest contribution ever, ever in the history of New Mexico from a Texas billionaire who has used his money to influence races all over the country, most notably the John Kerry race uh, in 2004 when he spent $38 million on a presidential race. People aren't, he isn't doing that out of the goodness of his heart. He, and he's not doing it because he cares about New Mexico. She's also taken $800,000 that we know of so far from big corporations, industries, powerful industries. Those people don't care about New Mexicans either. I'm very proud of the fact that I have 16,000 contributions from all over New Mexico, and 92% of my money comes from New Mexico. My, my contributors uh, have invested in me because they know that this is about New Mexico families. Well, let's, let's get back to the Texas thing. You know, there was a very controversial ad that played on this uh, this animosity that New Mexicans have historically had with Texas. And uh, Susana Martinez was called Tejana. And, I, and this has backfired a little bit. I think that there have been some people who feel alienated and who feel like it is not staying true to democratic values to label her as a Tejana. How do you respond to people who've criticized that ad? Well, I want to remind people that 
She brought Texas into the race when she took a $450,000 contribution from Robert Perry in Houston. She has, she was born in Texas. That makes her a Texan. She took Texas money. She's got Texas style politics. And when I say that, here's what I mean. Her money's coming from friends of Karl Rove that live in Texas, 100,000 here, 200,000 there. That money's coming to her. And she's advocating Texas policies, just like the Bush administration. But what do we have to fear from Texas? I mean, you grew up in Hobbs. We all have friends in Texas. We go back and forth. We have business contacts there. Why are we so afraid of Texas? Well, because we've been a water battle with Texas for over 20 years. Uh, I don't know if Susanna will remember this when she was growing up in Texas. We have had fierce water battles. Many of the people who have given to her now, we know, ranchers and farm uh, ranchers and oil industry people just on the other side of the state line, are engaged in water battles with the state of New Mexico. So what do we think they're going to do? How can they take mm -hmm. our water, these folks who've given her money? What could she do? They can continue to ask us and force us to spend our money litigating water issues in New Mexico. And they, it, and she will, they have an interest in giving her money. There is no doubt about it. They have an interest in giving her money. Well, what, what, could, what could she do as governor to give them what they want? Well, she's part of all any, any water compact agreements that happen. Governors have to sign off on any water settlements that have to happen in New Mexico. Any governor in the future will be a part of that. I have a different approach. My approach is that, we, one, we have to fully fund any water disputes that we have. We have to work with our acequias, our traditional water users, our tribal water, water users, who frankly have managed water in this state since before the U.S. even existed. And, and we need a, water, a continued state water plan where regions of New Mexico are, are really um, represented and they all have a stake in the game. I come from southeastern New Mexico. We sit over the Okalala Basin. Texas is sucking up every single day so many acre feet from the New Mexico side. We have to fight those battles and New Mexicans should be assured that there is somebody on the side of New Mexico that's not got investors in her, in her future from Texas. Let me shift gears a little bit and talk about poverty. We have, I took some questions from Twitter and Facebook, and we have one from Twitter. Dale wants to know, what single thing can the state do to end New Mexico's culture of poverty? Well, getting out of poverty has to do with two things. Number one is job creation. We have to have a focus on job creation in New Mexico. I have said how I would do it, investing in what New Mexico does best, entrepreneurship and small business. We have people all over New Mexico who are willing to take risks, artisans who are making pottery, jewelry, painting, uh, have live performance studios. We have small businesses who are doing research and development, high-tech research and development. We have caterers and culinary artists who are working all over New Mexico. We need to give them a tax credit for creating a job. We need to make it easier for them to get started. And then we need to invest in more in the innovative, uh, long-term job creation of clean energy, of growing healthcare occupations, which are going to be part of our future, especially with healthcare reform. And, second, and thirdly, we need to invest in things like the film industry, the hospitality industry, the tourism industry, creating jobs in those industries. But we cannot do that unless we, it goes hand in hand with education and creating, uh, motivating our students to stay in school and showing them an opportunity for the future. So the best, uh, on the jobs angle, the best way to create those jobs is, do you think, through tax credits and incentives for those companies to create jobs? Is that it? I think we have to motivate small business owners to hire, create jobs, give them incentives. I also think we need to invest in the industries of the future. Uh, for instance, use part of New Mexico's revenue bond stream to invest in clean energy industries in New Mexico. We've done it before, you know, have a dedicated revenue stream from our severance tax bonds, put it into innovative new industries that are growing uh, in New Mexico. But, but there's, there's different approaches to job creation. 
My opponent actually, her proposal is to get rid of regulations, which hurts New Mexico families and hurts New Mexico business. About education, um, you know, there is so much concern still. How do you explain how we have in the past eight years not seen more progress in education. I mean, we're still so upset about it. Parents are still so concerned. It's still such a hot button issue. Why haven't we seen more progress? Well, let me tell you the progress we have seen. First of all, New Mexico raised teacher salaries by 6%. Graduation rates just in 08 and 09 went up from 60% to 66%. The national average is 70%. But nobody's satisfied with where we are. I'm not happy with it. I know people in the your listening audience aren't happy. And I believe the way to improve education is to do the following. Fully fund education. Put more resources in the classroom. Let's not short shrift education. Let's fund quality teacher training. Let's fund accountability and fair evaluation. Let's fund early childhood in, uh, education in a way that's meaningful. We have made progress. I led the way on early childhood education. 17,000 kids have gone to four-year-old pre-K. And what does that mean? Those 17,000 kids perform 24% on average better than kids that haven't. That's how we close the achievement gap. That's how we increase the graduation rate. And it's a long, slow process. We've been working at it for a long time, but it's, it's a combination of investing, fully funding education, giving people opportunity. It's a, it's a commitment to public education and the continuum of education that's going to make the difference. We've had some new budget numbers out this week. Um, and you were talking, before we sat down, you were talking about uh, the financial situation as it looks uh, now and taxes. Tell me again what how you see taxes uh, in the past influencing the budget situation now? Well, we made a lot of tax cuts and um, the governor of uh, New Mexico reduced our income tax, reduced um, capital gains tax, and also reduced the tax on food and medicine. We didn't, we didn't see that there was going to be this global economic crisis that hit us in New Mexico. But the fact is, that's the past, this is the future we have a budget shortfall. Here's how we're going to take care of it. First of all, we're going to cut we're going to do what families are doing in state government. We're going to tighten our belt. I put out a 36 point plan. I don't think we have time to go through those 36 points, <laughs> Gwyneth. Not all of them. Um, but the, the the point is it would save New Mexico 450 million dollars over 5 years. And here it's some things we can do at no cost, low cost. Trim back the state car fleet. Cut Get rid of 100 or more political employees. Put in a wellness plan to keep state employee health premiums level or lower them so that we can save money at the state level. Do smart reorganization. Uh, get rid of some cabinet secretaries. Combine things, combine services. Um, and, and also do voluntary buyouts for people who are ready to retire. That could save us about $30 million a year. My plan saves about $90 million a year. The second thing that's important is we have these out-of-state corporations who get these huge tax breaks. They shield their profits. It's unbelievable to me that we can't close that tax loophole because every New Mexico business pays taxes on their profits. Your opponent calls this a tax hike. It's not a tax hike. It's closing a loophole and it's giving the New Mexico businesses and families a fair shake and levels the playing field with those people. But my opponent says that because she's on the side of those big corporations. That's who she's fighting for. Well, and I'm fighting for small it, businesses it and families. Her argument is that it, it creates a hostile business environment. You know, if she wanted to make her argument, Gwyneth, she should have been here. Susana Martinez has had great luck with uh, painting you as attached to the hip with Bill Richardson. And um, you, you, you know, you've had a little bit of trouble separating yourself mm -hmm. from him. How do you describe, uh, as quickly and simply as possible, how you are different from him? Well, first of all, um, you know, I didn't get to be lieutenant governor by um, just waiting for somebody to tell me what to do. I'm very independent. I've been independent all my life. Uh, but 
here's the here's the point. I've taken the lieutenant governor's office and made it into something that it never was before. I've been the most active lieutenant governor in the history of New Mexico. But here's how I'm different, and here's some of the things I actually would have done differently than the governor. I would have never let the legislature go home without passing an eth a full comprehensive ethics package that included an independent ethics commission. It's been on the table for two or three years. He should have made them stay there to do that in a special session rather than, um, it's the time for talking about all that's I think is over. Secondly, I would not have expanded the state's political appointees in those great numbers. And most of all, I wouldn't, I, I'm, I'm a New Mexican. I was born here, I was raised here. I'm running for office because of that, not because I have further political ambitions. Are you but, calling him a carpetbagger? Yeah. Well, he, you know, he had further political ambitions. That's what I'm saying. Um, and it, that's what I think New Mexicans don't like about many of people that get into politics. They believe they're always looking beyond the horizon. I'm looking to be governor of New Mexico, you know, and I'm not a flashy candidate, uh, but the governor, I've disagreed with him, and I've agreed with him from time to time. I agreed with him when I agreed with him on some issues, but I've disagreed, and I've been disappointed too in some of the things that he's done. The legislature had several opportunities to pass comprehensive ethic, ethics legislation, or even smaller pieces of ethics legislation, some anti-corruption bills, and very few made it out of there. Do you feel like you're paying for that now? I don't think I'm paying for it. I think it's shameful what they did. But if I'm governor, on the first day I get sworn in, I'm going to do an executive order that says, that creates one. A lot of people say, oh, you can't do that. You're going to have to fight a battle. I'll fight that battle and I'll take it on. But it must be independent so that anybody, any citizen, can feel like they'd lodge a serious complaint, that it will be looked into, investigated. That, that it will have the that the commission would have the opportunity to request subpoenas from their district court, that they could make sure that they were following up on it. Uh, I think that's very very important that the average citizen feels like they can lodge a complaint, and this would not be a commission under the control of the governor or the legislature. Do you wish that you could have persuaded the Democrat-controlled legislature to do more? That, as lieutenant governor, that's the governor's job. As lieutenant governor, I persuaded them to do the things that were on, that I took on. Early childhood education, micro-lending opportunities. I have a small office of six people. It was the governor's job to persuade the legislature to follow a different agenda. But I persuaded them to follow my agenda, which was getting help to small businesses, access to capital, credit. 2,000 businesses have benefited. We should invest more in that. Another part of your plan to save the state money involves consolidating state agencies. And I just want to ask you really quickly, what are maybe the top three places where you think you could make the most effective uh, changes there, the most effective consolidations, and how you think that you can persuade uh, state workers that that's the right thing to do? Well, you have to persuade the legislature that go, that there's a smart restructuring program. Some of that work is already underway. There's a government restructuring task force. They actually took some of my suggestions, which they're debating in the government restructuring task force. What are your three project. favorites of those? Well, I think uh, take creating a Department of Commerce and Tourism, putting those two together. I get some pushback on that, you know, from people who are want to keep their jobs, but the truth is tourism is a five and a half billion dollar industry and it is part of commerce in New Mexico. So let's put those together, consolidate backroom services, make sure we have a one person in tourism and one person in commerce or economic development and have them work together. Uh, some other ideas is to bring state personnel over to Department of Finance and Administration. Maybe put GSD. Those people work in tandem all the time. Let's consolidate them into one department and, and have them work more closely together. You know, it's, it's not really so much about, uh, it's, it's about doing it smartly. It's not about getting rid of things as much as it is about working smartly. Let me just ask you one last question before we go. If you don't win, what are you going to do? What does the future hold for Diane Dennis? You know, what I've learned this year is that um, you give up a lot to be in public life. 
I have three great grandkids, you know, that wonderful grandkids who've been born during the time that I've been Lieutenant Governor. So certainly putting my family back on the front burner, spending more time with them. They've been here helping me in New Mexico, living in New Mexico. And then I have some other ideas about other opportunities that I've always wanted to explore. One of those is always about pursuing a higher education degree. Uh, but, you know, I've had a long history in New Mexico of working in the nonprofit, the business community. But I want to be governor. So I haven't put a lot of thought into that. I've, said, I've shaken thousands of hands in my career. People have said to me in great numbers this year, I'm voting for you. I believe in you. And you know what? I believe in them. And I think they're going to elect me governor on November 2nd. Well, thank you for being with us here today. Thank you.